Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Su Ling Ching, and it is my honor to be the president and CEO of the Ottawa Board of Trade. We are the uh, voice of business and the key advocate for economic development in the nation's capital. And we have a mission to cultivate a thriving world-class business community. We're here today in service to our local businesses to convene uh, this town hall. Uh, we haven't done a town hall for a little while and we thought that it might be a good time uh, to connect you directly with business and community leaders as we navigate these changing times together in an effort to build a strong future. So thank you for making time to be here. I'd like to extend a special welcome to the chair of our board of directors, Mr. Ian Sherman. Thank you for being here and also to acknowledge uh, several economic partners who are joining us today, including Michael Crockett from Ottawa Tourism, Michelle Gru from ACOBIA, uh, the Ottawa Coalition of BIAs. Um, I think we have Steve Ball here from the Ottawa Gatineau Hotel Association. I see Nina Kressler here from the Shaw Center. Uh, Brian, thank you for joining us. Uh, Brian Ohasky from the Rideau Center, and of course, Lise Bourgeois, uh, from La Cité. So hopefully I haven't missed anyone, but um, we work very closely with all of our local economic stakeholders uh, for the for the purposes of uh, economic growth in Ottawa and supporting our businesses. And so we're very pleased to have you all here. We're going to begin with a few opening remarks from our special guests who are, of course, Minister McLeod, Minister Fullerton, Mayor Watson, and Dr. Brent Mahoney from Ottawa Public Health. Uh, after which we'll have a moderated Q&A. So please feel free to submit some questions into the chat. And thank you to those who sent some questions along ahead of time. Um, and if possible, please do be on mute unless you're speaking so that we can uh, hear very clearly uh, what our distinguished guests have to share with us. So our first guest who's going to speak today is uh, the Honourable Lisa McLeod, who is the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries and the MPP for the Riding of Nepean. Uh, Lisa was first elected to the Ontario Legislature in 2006 by election as the youngest MPP in that parliament and the youngest conservative woman to be elected in Ontario, federally or provincially. She represented the Nepean Carlton riding, uh, winning elections in 2007, 2011 and 2014, and has continued to represent the constituents of Nepean since the boundaries were changed in the 2018 provincial election. I turn it over to you, Lisa. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, thanks very much, Su Ling. It's a real honor and privilege to be here with my uh, cabinet colleague, the Honorable Mary Lee Fullerton, as well as uh, our friend and our mayor, uh, Jim Watson, his worship, and of course, uh, with, with Brent, who has been working um, uh, so hard uh, throughout this pandemic, and I would be remiss not to say thank you uh, to all of the, the, the uh, public health officials in our city uh, who have uh, worked uh, without fail to uh, keep our city safe and protected. Um, I want to start off by talking about our city. And, uh, and, it's, and, and my view on what has happened this past weekend, uh, because I think we can't really have a conversation about the economic and social recovery of Ontario or the city of Ottawa without addressing some of the challenges. Um, we live here. Um, our kids go to school here. Uh, our friends, our neighbors, our family members take uh, bus and roads and bridges to get to work here. And we work here. And I have to say, uh, this past weekend, we've seen an inability for people to get back to uh, work, to get to their medical appointments. Uh, some children who have been out of school for a better part of uh, this past uh, two years uh, were again in the inner core, unable to do so. And I think that um, it really is, is time uh, for those folks um, who've made their point to go home. I want to thank the mayor and, and council and, of course, uh, our city police for ensuring that uh, that message of protection is one that uh, we continue to talk about, because quite frankly, everyone supports peaceful protests in this province. But what we do not support um, are, are Nazi flags or swastikas that are, are littered around. And some of us in many campaigns uh, have had that happen to us, and it, it isn't pleasant. But I, I think symbols of hate have no place in our nation's capital. Uh, nor do they have a place in um, in anywhere in this country. Um, we, we also, 
We've also obviously have seen some challenges with respect to uh, um, people understanding what are national monuments and what aren't. Um, and the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, which is also a place where a Canadian hero was, was, was murdered, um, is, is a place to be uh, respected. Uh, and and I, I think that uh, what we saw was, was very, very um, uh, tragic in, in the sense of what we, what we aimed to, to uh, preserve and protect in this province. Um, in addition, of course, uh, Canadian hero Terry Fox uh, led a convoy himself, um, one that reminds us of, of what is great to celebrate as Canadians. Um, and so, uh, I, obviously, I just wanted to start off there, and I know my colleagues will likely offer some of those remarks, as this is the first time we had the opportunity to gather. You know, uh, Ottawa is much more than um, the seat of Parliament. It's much more than the largest agricultural city in the world. It's much more than often being the largest and coldest um, city uh, that is a capital in the world. Um, it's it's where we live, and again, I just I want to reiterate it. It is, and this is you know, this is something you don't normally hear from a tourism minister, but it is time for them to go home. Um, after all, uh, I represent my constituents in the legislature. I represent uh, this city and cabinet, and I represent both in cabinet and uh, and in the legislature. And and so it's really important to me that we we address that situation. But just as we've all done throughout this pandemic, is look forward, look forward to the art of possibilities. Uh, post COVID-19 and, and today is an opportunity to do that. You know, we started this month and this year uh, with more restrictions uh, placed on uh, the, the population as a result of the, uh, the spread, the rapid spread of the Omicron virus. Um, and today we have the gradual easing of those restrictions and many of the businesses in our city, uh, whether they're within the heritage sport tourism and culture industries or they're part of the automotive or retail um, are really going to be able to welcome these easing restrictions uh, in order to um, best do what they they they're they're doing, which is uh, to, to do business to do um, to make us feel better socially. And I had the opportunity yesterday uh, to see that Canadian pride um, in action uh, in Hamilton while we saw the Canadian men's uh, soccer team win its 10th game in a row, uh, two nothing over the United States. And it really was a, a fine display of patriotism. It was really a fine display of uh, the social recovery of the province of Ontario. And it was really a fine display of what economic recovery can look like. And that's been my focus over the past uh, almost uh, two years now is making sure that we plan for success post COVID-19. And that's why the ministry that I represent has been working with organizations, uh, small and medium sized businesses as well, well as large corporations, including not for profit uh, groups as well in the city in order to support them. And many of you, as, as we had Minister Beth Balvi here not too long ago in person, um, I was able to talk about some of the investments that our, our, as our government we made just through my ministry alone, um, whether that's to the Ontario Art Gallery or the Ottawa Art Gallery, uh, to the Diefenbunker Museum. Uh, we've been investing in the Shepherds of Good Hope and the, the RA Centre. Uh, some of the things that we support um, include marketing with Ottawa Tourism in order to showcase Ontario um, and, and certainly our nation's capital. We continue to work with our uh, other museums across the city. Um, and right now I have 10 ministerial advisory committees, which is very well populated uh, from Dot Jans in Manatick um, at the Black Dog uh, to the Museum of Nature and the War, War, War Museum. And, and of course, working with uh, so many others uh, that have a, a real interest in starting to see both our, our heritage sectors back up and running, um, our cultural institutions uh, back up and, and spreading what they do best in, in terms of joy and happiness. And of course, uh, the tourism and, and sports sectors. And I know many of you are probably excited to get back to the gym and, uh, and to get back to going to the movies and eating your popcorn when you go there. And that's why our government will continue to make these investments. Uh, right now, of course, we do have a small business supports running for the sectors that uh, I represent and those that had to be closed. Uh, we also have energy rebates. Um, but I'm particularly excited that later this week I'll be announcing um, over $100 million for tourism recovery funding. And that's going to go a long way in making sure that not only can these businesses survive this pandemic, but will thrive when we're finally able to uh, have international visitors come back um, to the extent that they've done. So uh, that's where I wanted to, to lead this conversation today, Su Ling. I think that it's important for all of us to address uh, the social and economic impacts, not only of COVID-19, 
uh, but of what we've seen over the past weekend. But I do believe there is a path forward for not only our city, but I believe for this entire province. And I'm look, looking forward to working with all of you for a, a solution to all of these situations. And I look forward to a continued dialogue. So with that, I just want to say thank you. And I look forward to, um, I look forward to uh, answering some questions and talking to uh, all of those who are participating. So thank you. Thank you very much, Minister McLeod, for your ongoing support and collaboration and message of um, hope for the future. I would like uh, now to welcome Honorable Marilee Fullerton, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Dr. Marilee Fullerton is a medical professional who spent her career helping people in her community. She is the Member of Parliament for the writing of Kanata Carlton. She was first elected in 2018 and before serving as this uh, in this ministry, she served in the cabinet as the Minister for Training Colleges and Universities and also for the Minister uh, as the Minister of Long-Term Care. So welcome Minister Fullerton. Thank you much, uh, Suleen, and, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, what a time it's been. And, uh, you know, I always say uh, every one of us needs to lead with our head and our heart to bring compassion and empathy, but also to bring the analytical and uh, understanding of, of the, the real world that people are living in uh, day to day. And our business community is so close to my heart. I spent the bulk of my adult life uh, with a, a family in business. I know the blood, sweat, and tears that, that people put into their businesses and uh, how it serves our communities. And then I echo the comments of, uh, of Minister McLeod on, on the, the, the dis discomforting situation we have in our capital right now. And I do believe that, uh, that it is through communication and relationships that we can find a path forward. All levels of government work together and, uh, and listen to our constituents and the people being affected uh, in so many ways by, by this really horrible uh, virus. So I wanna thank also my colleague um, for her role. She's been in a very challenging portfolio, obviously with everything that's been happening. And uh, I really look forward to hearing her comments later as well. Um, the business community has certainly been hard hit. Some more than others, some have fared reasonably well. And I think if we look at the relationships that we can build through this and come out better on the other side. So whether we look at where we've been, where business was before the, uh, the pandemic hit, and I remember being at, um, at the mayor's breakfast and uh, talking about the, the challenges that we were facing, getting the economy rolling, getting the training done uh, for, the, for the workforce that we needed, and really taking a principled approach an approach that really considered the stability and um, you know the, the certainty that needed to be uh, created to stabilize our business community. And it is, it is our businesses that, that create the prosperity. It is our businesses that um, create opportunity uh, for our current workforce, for our children and into the future. So I, I really wanna emphasize how important it is for us to be listening and understanding what your concerns are and then working with all levels of government to really understand how we address uh, all the issues that are, are here now and that are coming. And uh, so when we um, think about the roadmap to reopening, um, you know, you've heard from my, my cabinet colleagues over the last two years about the impact of COVID on our businesses. And I was fortunate to get quite a number of them um, out to uh, Canada Carlton, out to the city of Ottawa, Peter Bethlen Falvey, Minister of Finance, um, Minister Vic Fidelli, um, Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, uh, Minister Kinga Surma, Infrastructure, uh, Nina Tangri, um, Red Tape, Small Business and Red Tape Reduction, and Khalid Rashid, the Associate Minister of uh, Digital Government. And that's just in the last four months. And so, you know, I think not only do we need to understand the need to be listening, we need to demonstrate that we are. And, uh, and I think that uh, my colleagues in cabinet and the, and the legislature are so aware uh, of the important contributions that uh, the Ottawa business community makes, not only for the economy uh, of Ontario, but I would say for the all, all of Canada, um, particularly if we look at um, at, uh, you know, in Canada Carleton, where we have the a very, uh, well, Canada's largest tech park and the, the contributions of the tech community. Um, and I know uh, Minister McLeod, as, uh, as the Minister for the Hospitality Sector, um, has been very vocal about getting supports for, for her, um, 
her, her organizations that she represents through that as well. So I know that all of you, the business associations, all of you on this call have, um, have questions and uh, I'm looking forward to being able to answer those. The, the networks that we can create and the better that we can feed that information forward um, to uh, cabinet, to MPPs, you know, our other Ottawa area MPPs uh, and cabinet ministers, I think is incredibly um, beneficial. And when we look at, um, you know, the, the rebound that's needed to get everything going in Ottawa and across the province with all cylinders, and, and I, I kind of laugh when I say that because the, um, when we think about the, uh, the advances in technology and the innovation, so much of, of, uh, of that is changing. We don't talk about cylinders anymore. We talk about um, the importance of, um, of auto autonomous vehicles here in Ottawa. We talk about how we create a community, a city that is developed for the changes that are coming in technology. And there is tremendous potential. And I, I hear from constituents every day who tell me what they're working on, and their hopes and dreams. And you know, I just see that energy that is, um, it is there. There's a lot of hope, but the, the difficulties that our businesses have faced, uh, they need to be acknowledged, understood in a fulsome way and when we look at the um, the, uh, the supports that have been put out, we have continued to put out supports all along. Have they been perfect? No, um, but we have certainly um, attempted to to work with the federal governments, a federal government, our municipal government, understand how we work together and and fill the gaps, and uh, and we can answer some of those questions. I'm sure you have them uh, later on, um, but really to to make sure that the the efforts that we have. Um, created for supporting our businesses. We recognize, and I hear from people who feel like they've fallen through the gaps with their businesses. And so when I hear that, I call my colleagues, my ministers and say, you know, what is um, happening? What can we do? What else can we do? So um, I'm very much looking forward to the, the, um, the questions that you have today. I can talk about a number of other programs that we've had. Um, but I think I'll, I'll save those. I don't want to take up all the time talking. I want to do more listening. So I look forward to your um, your comments and your questions. And and uh, please stay engaged. It's just so important that we hear from you. And thank you for to Su Ling for, for helping to organize this. Thank you, Minister Fullerton. And so now I'd like to welcome Mayor Jim Watson. Um, mayor Watson was re-elected as the mayor for a third consecutive term in 2018. He has dedicated most of his career to public service in Canada's capital, is an active member of this community and has served on many boards as honorary chair uh, of org local organizations. So welcome Mayor Watson, thank you for being here today. Great, thank you uh, very much Su Ling and Ian and the board of directors of the Board of Trade for uh, bringing us all together once again. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do it in person, but uh, the next best thing is technology. And to our two ministers, uh, thank you for your participation and uh, support of so many initiatives in our city, as well as uh, Dr. Brent and uh, other members of the business uh, community. Um, I want to, uh, as Lisa pointed out, thank uh, Dr. Brent and uh, um, Vera Etches and the whole team at Ottawa Health. I had the honor last week of announcing that we're going to we're giving the key to the city to the whole uh, branch of Ottawa Public Health uh, for the tremendous work that they have done over the course of the, the pandemic. And, um, you know, they're uh, stretched pretty thin. They're trying to do all their other normal work that they would do as a public health unit. And now they've been um, given the added burden or responsibility of doing the work of, of vaccinating and testing and so on. So very much impressed uh, with uh, their efforts, uh, as well as uh, a whole Team Ottawa approach to paramedic service for instance has done remarkable work and uh, ottawa has the best vaccination rate of any big city in canada that's something we should be very very proud of something i boast uh, about when i meet my colleagues from other big cities like toronto and and uh, vancouver and the like um, the city has been working closely with the business community in particular the board of trade we set up a mayor's economic recovery task force uh, whose mandate was to uh, look at what we can do with the limited tools we have at the municipal level and what can we ask the provincial and federal governments to do to help us uh, through this journey that are really um, a journey with no map that uh, you know can tell us what's going to happen next week let alone uh, next year you know two months ago omicron was not even a word that anyone had uttered now of course all of a sudden it's the predominant uh, variant 
So we've been working with this coalition, it includes everyone from the Board of Trade, the Ottawa Tourism, I see Michael on the call, uh, Invest Ottawa, the, B, the Council of BIAs, the Regroupement des Gens d'Affaires, um, the Film uh, Office, as well as uh, OMIC, and uh, I'm sure I'm missing other groups, the Festival Network, of course. Uh, all have come together. We meet on a regular basis um, as an effort to brainstorm, share best practices, and implement policies that can help uh, our small business community. So once again, you know, we've delivered another, uh, not quite knockout blow, but a blow as a result of the outrageous behavior of the truckers um, that have come to our city and the, their boorish behavior on the Cenotaph and Terry Fox Monument. And imagine going and demanding food from the Shepherds of Good Hope. Uh, quite, quite disgraceful. So we're uh, looking at ways on how we can um, help. We passed uh, in our budget just a few months ago, a new small business tax subclass uh, to help small businesses. The city has created this new property tax subclass that will provide a 15% discount to 10,000 small businesses across the city planned over two years. So 7.5% reduction this year, 7.5% uh, next year. Uh, I'm pleased the province has agreed to match this year 7.5% discount with a corresponding discount on the education tax portion of property tax for eligible small businesses. Once again, this year, for the third year in a row, we're eliminating all patio fees uh, for hundreds of restaurants across the city. We'll also be closing streets that provide restaurants with approximately 500 more paying seats and customers. And like last year, if there are nice days in March, which I'm the eternal optimist, uh, we're going to allow patios to uh, open before uh, April 1st uh, to try to make up for some of the, the lost business uh, over the last several months. Now, in the, rate, the face of inflation, uh, the city is also pulling on all the stops to keep things affordable for residences and businesses across the city. Um, uh, for the 12th uh, consecutive budget, I'm very pleased my colleagues supported my cap on taxes so that people understand and can budget accordingly uh, what the tax rate is going to be as opposed to this up and down uh, that we've seen in, in years uh, gone by. Uh, with supply chain issues and inflation creeping up around the world, affordability is uh, important. And that's why we want to keep the tax rate at a reasonable level, um, you know, at or below the rate of inflation. Of course, uh, the tourism industry, um, as Lisa knows all too well, has been the most harshly hit uh, sector of um, the economy. Uh, people just aren't traveling, aren't staying in hotels. Uh, festivals have to be canceled or, or uh, altered in some way. And uh, we've created a cultural tourism working group that brings together uh, Ottawa and Gatineau and national institutions to designate 2022 as the year of cultural tourism in Ottawa, Gatineau. I just met with the mayor of Gatineau for our first official bilateral meeting, and she has a background in tourism, the former head of Udaway Tourism. So she understands the importance of getting the tourism industry, ho hospitality sector, uh, attractions, as well as... Um, uh, <clears throat> as well as restaurants and, and other parts of performing arts and so on. So as restrictions lift, the city's destination marketing organization, Ottawa Tourism, will deliver a coordinated approach to marketing our region's cultural assets. Uh, and we have some beautiful cultural assets, not just at the national level, but also our Ottawa Art Gallery is spectacular and it's free admission uh, every day of the week. So we know that when people come here, they fall in love with our, our city and they want to come back. So I want to thank all the business owners, entrepreneurs for your contributions uh, to keep residents employed. Thank uh, the provincial and federal government for the various wage subsidy and rent subsidy programs that have helped sustain a number of businesses. And I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Merci. Merci, Mr. Mayor. Um, today's final speaker is Dr. Brent Mulholney. He is the Deputy Medical Officer of Health for Ottawa Public Health. He leads the public health medicine unit that provides public health specialist expertise to monitor and respond to disease incidents, including the application of relevant public health legislation, informs the public of public health hazards and community health programs, promotes the coordination of community health services, and assists the government and professional bodies in developing community health policies and programs. And so he has been um, a key speaker for us many times over the last couple of years, uh, both with uh, public events and closed meetings. And we appreciate your updates, Dr. Brent. So turn it over to you. Great, uh, thank you very much, Sue Ling, and uh, thank you for, for the invite to, today. And, um, you know, 
the the relationship uh you know over the last couple of years uh with the business community has been been really really important uh you know business and employment is a determinant of health uh, and we're in the health business and, and recognize that um communication has been you know really very important and you kept asking us back to your meetings even when you know we always haven't had good good news um but uh you know it's been important to 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 inform you and tell you, you know, what we're facing as a community since you're such a big part of it. Um, and thank you for the kind words from, from Mayor Watson and Ministers uh, McLeod and Fullerton. Certainly um, our relationship has been important to, to foster communication and collective understanding and, and action. Um, as, as previous speakers have said, Omicron really has been um, really a game changer. It, uh, it was percolating away in another part of the world and then came onto the scene and quickly took over market share, pushing Delta aside due to its to, you know, much increased transmissibility and, and so much transmission um, you know, leading to numerous outbreaks in vulnerable settings, pressures on our hospitals, and, and unfortunately uh, taking people's lives. Um, the good news after you know, a rough few weeks is, is we're seeing improvements in a number of indicators that have peaked and are descending, although many are still at a high level. Uh, at the moment. So we're seeing decreases in, in the wastewater signal. Um, the proportion of tests that are coming back positive uh, is high, but, but it's decreasing. Um, the number of new hospitalizations are decreasing, but there's still a lot of people in hospital due to COVID as well as those with COVID. Um, and we're continuing to uh, work with uh, uh, numerous settings across the city um, who are still experiencing out outbreaks. That includes long-term care, retirement homes, hospitals, and congregate settings. And currently there's 126 outbreaks in these settings across the city. Um, the one indicator that hasn't yet peaked, it's a lagging indicator, um, is unfortunately deaths. And, you know, there's, um, you know, a lot of, um, stuff in the media times talking about the mildness of Omicron. Well, you know, unfortunately the peak in the number of people that will end up dying of this wave will probably exceed any of the previous waves except the very first one in the spring of 2020. Um, so we'll continue to, to monitor and report on indicators to, to keep everyone informed as to how things are going as we've had done so over the last couple of years. In terms of where we're at, the good news, schools are open and that's important. They're essential for um, the well-being and development of our children. Uh, and as uh, speakers have said, I mean, and you're all aware, is, is, is this is the first uh, day of reopening for many businesses and other settings. Um, and that's an important step, obviously. Um, and the government's plan to open incrementally is important because we still need you know, a cautious approach. There's still a lot of COVID in our city um, and there are many in our city who have not been infected with Omicron. Um, so the messaging stays the same. Um, you know, people who are sick with symptoms need to stay home uh, until their symptoms have resolved. This will help protect people uh, for severe illness and, and slow the spread. Um, and, you know, with the new guidance from the province that came out a couple of weeks ago, certainly outside the highest risk, risk settings for people who are fully vaccinated, the isolation period is, 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 for, is five days. Um, and so if they're not uh, having a fever and, and their symptoms are improving, then they're able to, to leave isolation um, as long as they wear a mask around other people. Um, in terms of uh, workplace uh, places, um, so we uh, rescinded our letter of instruction requiring workplaces to notify, about, notify us of two or more uh, COVID cases in a 14-day period. Um, and there's more information uh, for workplaces on our, on our website at Workplace COVID-19 for, for information on, on preventing and COVID and communicating with your employees. Now, the Omicron wave would have been even more severe if we didn't have the high levels of vaccination that, uh, that Mayor Watson uh, was talking about. Um, but we still have room for improvement. Um, we still strongly recommend that all residents eligible for a third dose of the COVID vaccine receive one as soon as possible. Um, certainly there's evidence that uh, immunity can wane over time. And so that third dose provides greater protection against severe illness and complications. 
um, and, and clear evidence um, that uh, the rates of hospitalization due to Omicron infection are significantly higher in the unvaccinated than in the vaccinated. Uh, in terms of supporting uh, the people of Ottawa to, to get vaccinated, we've expanded our drop-in capacity at all of our community COVID vaccination clinics to everyone who's eligible, whether it's first, second, or, or booster doses. Um, and we will continue to provide daily updates on specific clinic availability on our social media platforms and website. Um, and then in closing, because we're interested in hearing what questions you may have, um, you know, while we're all tired of COVID, COVID unfortunately isn't tired of us. You know, we're on a pathway towards treating COVID like other respiratory viruses, but we're not, not quite there yet. Um, and so particularly as we reopen and provide more opportunities for potential transmission, the importance of staying home if sick, masking and distancing, they all continue to play important roles in preventing transmission. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Brent. And um, I just want to echo the accolades for OPH that we've been very grateful to have formed an extremely strong relationship with your organization as we support the business community. We know that you've been extremely sensitive to supporting our employers uh, during this time. So I appreciate it. Um, please feel free to put questions in the chat um, for any of our speakers, but I will just start um, Mayor Watson, I'll just get this one out of the way because everyone has mentioned it and I appreciate the comments that everyone's made and, and we too support uh, people's right to demonstrate, um, but also feel as though that that work has been done and it's time to go. Uh, just a question asking if there's uh, further steps that can be considered for moving the trucks downtown or if, th if there's something that's on your radar that you will do to continue to handle the situation. Yeah, thank you for that. There, uh, we've started to see some movement in the sense that some of the truckers are starting to leave uh, different parts of the city. Uh, Sir George Etsia Cartier uh, Parkway is now open and trucks have left that site. Uh, the Sir Johnny McDonald Parkway, I think, has three of the four lanes open. Uh, there are some uh, diehards that they say they're refusing to leave until the mandate is reversed, which is a ridiculous uh, premise. And the Prime Minister was very clear that that's not going to happen. Uh, and we've been pushing back uh, through uh, the organizers that uh, they should not only be moving uh, along, they should be apologizing to uh, the people of Ottawa for this great disruption, the, the disgraceful um, defecation of the uh, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and the Shepherds of Good Hope incident and the Terry Fox. We saw earlier, uh, I think it was today or yesterday, Rocks were thrown in an ambulance. There were racialized slurs towards racialized members of our ambulance paramedic service. This kind of behavior is not, <clears throat> not acceptable. As you know, in Ontario, in Ontario and in Canada, politicians are not allowed by law to direct police operations. But having said that, I've had um, you know, probably uh, more calls than uh, he cares to remember with Chief Slowly. Uh, we do have contingency plans. Uh, to deal with uh, a number of different scenarios. Those will not be released and we're not going to talk about when they're going to be implemented because we want to keep this event peaceful and, um, and, uh, and calm. It's been very frustrating for the small business community up all the way up to the Rideau Center, the millions of dollars in, in lost revenue as a result of people coming and storming the Rideau Center and yelling and screaming and not wearing a mask and really intimidating and threatening, you know, young people, you know, minimum wage jobs, uh, are put in this awkward position where these big burly truck drivers come out and start yelling at them because they won't be served because they're not wearing a mask. So we're in negotiations with the so-called organizers. As you know, with these kinds of big events, often the organizers lose control or they choose not to take control. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I concur with what you said, Suley. They, they had their say, they had their moment in the sun. It's time for them to move on and go back to their own communities and lobby their federal MPs back in their hometown so that we can regroup and, and uh, bring some peace of mind, particularly the, the businesses and the residences in the Golden Triangle, Byward Market, Rideau Street, uh, Center Town. Thank you, Mayor Watson. Um, I have a few questions that all sort of are around the same theme, uh, probably for the, one of the ministers, uh, Fullerton or McLeod, around the state of testing um, and contact tracing and access to rapid tests. Uh, where do we see that going? Will that continue to be a priority? 
Um, I'll just quickly share, um, as you probably know, we were working with the Ontario Chamber and both levels of government to deliver rapid tests in Ottawa for small medium enterprises, but we've had supply issues since the middle of December. Uh, we are at the ready to, to distribute them as soon as we get them. And we are getting uh, constant updates, but we, we haven't got a, a clear date yet uh, moving forward, but we do have many businesses on the waiting list. So um, I don't know, Minister Fullerton or Rockcloud, if one of you has some insight there. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Thank you, Sue Ling. You know, I, I go back to my days in long-term care uh, at the in the spring of, of 2020, when we were desperately looking for um, rapid tests and they had not been approved by Health Canada at that point. So we are fortunate uh, that we have procured many millions of, of uh, rapid tests uh, by the province, but also that the federal government um, is responsible for securing that supply. And they have promised, I, I believe, to all of Canada about 140 million. Um, we are uh, still waiting for more supply from the federal government and more tests will become available. But I believe uh, uh, we have um, purchased uh, tens of millions um, and also waiting for the, uh, the supplies coming in from the federal, um, federal government as well. And we are grateful for the, the tests that they have supplied. Um, Health Canada has approved a number of them, um, but obviously I, I recognize how, um, how eager people have been uh, to get hold of the rapid tests and we recognize that in every single test that we receive, um, we are distributing um, to uh, the general public, hospitals, long-term care homes, workplaces, childcare settings and schools. And obviously there's been a lot more emphasis on the schools right now as we reopen. Um, because of the supply uh, issues surrounding the rapid tests. And I don't know if, if uh, Minister McLeod or, or Brent. Um... Uh, thanks, Minister. I, I do. So we, we are obviously continuing to work with the federal government. We anticipate in the next couple of weeks uh, we'll see an increase in the supply. So obviously these are procured uh, by the federal government, as Minister Fullerton has noted. So uh, that trickle down comes to the provinces. Uh, having said that, we were able to uh, mit mitigate some of the uh, supply constraints uh, to meet some demands for these um, rapid antigen tests. And we were able to uh, procure an additional 65 million in December and January in addition to the 20 million that we were able to uh, previously procure. So uh, right at the moment, we've got about 85 million that have been going out. And in the next couple of weeks, we anticipate uh, that we will be able to get more into the hands of uh, public health officials as well as uh, Ontarians. So uh, it, it continues to be a work in progress based on, um, as Minister Fullerton said, uh, what we were able to receive from the federal government. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions here around the uh, reopening and how we're feeling about the stability of being able to uh, stay open and then for the purposes of event planning as well uh, coming into the spring. Yeah, I can probably take uh, that uh, for two reasons. One, obviously the reopening framework, um, a lot of those regulatory um, uh, uh, amendments uh, are done by my team along with uh, the Ministry of Health and the Solicitor General. And then on the event piece that, uh, that tends to be a lot of our um, work as well. Uh, so I think that you can re you can rely on the stability. The last thing the Premier and any of us want is to roll back, which is why, as Brent noted, we are taking a gradual increase um, or, or, uh, or decreasing or lessening of the restrictions. And so uh, we're starting to see many of indoor facilities, with the exception of large arenas um, and stadiums, uh, go back to 50% capacity. Uh, and we are we continue to ask people to social distance and masks were required. Um, in addition, we're allowing um, you know larger um, events outside. And as we saw that yesterday with uh, Team Canada and the United States, uh, so so th that's happening. Uh, we continue to monitor the the spread of Omicron, but we are very. Um, I, I think cautiously optimistic that the numbers are going in the right direction as our hospitalizations and ICU uh, in order to make those determinations. So um, in terms of the work that we're doing with the ministry, and then I'll get to the, um, I'll get to the events piece. Uh, as I noted, we have about 10 ministerial advisory committees uh, in all of the sectors that I represent. And so Michael Crockett is on one of them. I know Colin uh, Morrison is here. He's provided with a great deal of advice. Aaron Benjamin is, is on one of them. Uh, Nina Kressler is on another. Uh, so a number of the folks in Ottawa have the opportunity to be at that table. We work extremely well with health, labor, um, as, as well as other ministries as required uh, in order to ensure that. So I, I'm optimistic. 
Um, do I think I'm going to have full capacity um, for Eugene Melnick um, like next week? No, um, but I think that we're in we're in good shape in order for us to start um, or you know reopening while the kids are in school and classrooms and and monitor that impact. And so I think it's a reasonable approach, but I think it's also one that's stable and can be um, uh, predicted better this time, particularly as Minister Mayor Watson said. You know, uh, just uh, five six weeks ago, we really didn't utter the word Omicron and here it is and, and it's hit us. With respect to event planning, um, obviously this is uh, something important to me because as, uh, as Nina would know, I've got not one, but two uh, in my portfolio of convention, the, the two uh, largest convention centers in the, in the province, um, two of the best known in, in the country, if not North America. And so we have a vested interest in trying to make sure that they safely reopen. We've been able to provide them with st stabilization funding um, right now in order for, for them to uh, make payments. But, you know, certainly we want to see uh, Nina working with Michael Crockett to bring in uh, world-class events uh, at the right time. So we're going to continue to work with them with the rules that are in place. My ministry provides uh, technical briefings um, often, uh, in, especially when we have uh, new restrictions being implemented or eased. And so those voices are around the table and we like to provide that. But I would like to just offer this because what I was really impressed with um, in two things that one we're doing and one that Mayor Watson is doing that I think can help Ottawa. And that is um, the 2023 year of the cultural tourism um, in addition to our staycation tax credit. And one of the things I've challenged industry, but also um, those who work within the ministry or um, who are working in order to support the objectives of the ministry is to look at stackable incentives. And I'll just give you an example, like uh, with the people that are on here, Carolyn Pachin and Fran will have an idea of all of the festivals and events that are happening in Ottawa. And to feed that into someone like Cor Colin Morrison, who may want to uh, be able to stack some of those incentives on top of that. And, and maybe Aaron Benjamin has some ideas on Canadian live music. And I think if we have an integrated marketing strategy uh, to let people know that that's happening, but that our independent operators are also uh, part of that. So right now the staycation tax credit only um, allows for accommodation um, to be part of that. And, and, that's, and, and, and that is a baked, uh, that's a baked pie right there. So it's not gonna change. But where I do think there's opportunities is working with other sectors um, within the industry and encouraging them to, uh, to promote. So a, a local restaurant or a local festival or a lo local hockey tournament, uh, working with the hoteliers in order to um, get the message out. So when it's safe to travel, you should, you should be staying in hotels. And so um, those are some of the things that excite me. And I, I really do believe we're going to see uh, a stable reopening just based on the conversations that I have and they often will start at six, seven in the morning and they'll go into the evenings. And um, it's something the Premier and I talk about pretty pretty much on a daily basis, uh, just because of the relevancy to the sectors that uh, I represent, um, not only here at home, but uh, around the cabinet table. If there was any further questions, if I could provide that additional clarification, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Um, I have one question here about okay. business supports and Mr. Okay. Yes? Sorry, can I just add one more thing to, to um, Mr. McLeod's comments? Certainly. Just in terms of, um, you know, trying to, to go unidirectional to, to things opening up, one thing that one could do to make it even more likely is increase vaccination levels. I mean, we're, we are a leader, but we can, as I said, we can do better. There's a number of people out there who haven't had their third dose boosters, and it makes a big difference in terms of protection from infection, and even more so in terms of protection from hospitalization, serious illness. So it can help balance out the fact that things are opening and there's uh, going to be more opportunities for transmission. Vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate workers, your family, um, seniors, your kids. Thanks. Thank you, Brent. I, I appreciate you saying that and for emphasizing the fact that everyone here has a role to play in making sure this reopening happens. And, uh, and so I appreciate you saying that. Um, I'm just going to quickly ask about business supports because Minister Fullerton, you allowed, alluded to the fact that despite there are many business supports, as Lisa just said, um, and they are stackable, uh, that there are some that fall through the cracks and just the government's approach to um, there's the hardest hit sectors, but then there's there's a bunch of businesses too that are also impacted by the slowed economy in general. So. Yes, thank you. So, you know, we started fairly immediately with the on Ontario um, a Small Business uh, Support Fund. And uh, obviously, with the succession of waves that we've had, 
um, you know, we've understood the need to continue with those types of, of relief. Now, I will say that they, you know, we do hear from people that sometimes say that they were a new business and they didn't have a revenue uh, stream to demonstrate. Uh, and so that they, uh, you know, fell into a gap. And I want to acknowledge that because I think it's important that we understand how we support those. But there was the, uh, the Ontario Business Cost Rebate Program. Uh, the tax deferrals, the energy and the and the property tax deferrals, the Ontario COVID-19 Small Business Relief Grant, uh, and the um, Ontario Small Business Support Grant. And, you know, even with the electrical costs that are happening right now and the energy costs, we're cognizant of that and creating relief in, in terms of allowing people to get those rebates. There's the regional development program that has been really stimulating um, uh, the outflow of dollars to our businesses, and uh, and most recently the Advanced Manufacturing and Innovation Competitive, uh, Competitiveness Program, or AMIC, uh, and that was just recently announced. So, um, you know, there was the Main Street Recovery uh, Program that we created. We had legislative acts to support those. There was the Digital Main Street piece that allowed businesses to switch to a online presence. And, um, you know, this, these were dollars that allowed um, businesses to pivot and, and quickly. And, you know, some businesses were hard pressed and, uh, you know, there's a bit of a spectrum. Uh, some businesses were able to get, you know, the full amount and others were struggling to, uh, to put together the, the case because some, some of them were lacking that um, those revenue uh, streams being a new business. And so we're continuing, I'm continuing to go back to the Minister of Finance and say what more can be can be done in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, but when we look at the, the relief programs that we have continually revisited and renewed, as well as the federal uh, relief programs, we know that some sectors have been much harder hit than others. And and, uh, and I appreciate the good work that Minister McLeod has done and, uh, and also that the federal programs that have been there as well. Thank you. Um, so I see a question here that looks very lengthy from Michael Crockett. So perhaps I'll ask Michael to unmute and ask his question, please. Thanks, Elaine. And actually, Minister McLeod uh, did answer uh, a good portion. So I appreciate uh, that, the, the preemptive action, Minister. That's great. Um, but it really, it, it was partly about uh, thanking the city and the province for, for the programs that have been put in place to help tours and businesses. Of course, we're very, very grateful for that and the ongoing program, the, the tourism recovery program being a big one. Um, my question is really about once the trucks are gone and, and now with the gradual reopening of our economy, one of the things that can, we can really do together that'll help the downtown again become more vibrant is bringing back you know, a, a couple of thousand people at a time as the minister talked about and increasing our market share in meetings and conventions. And so hoping that there's some creative ways um, that we can work together both with the, the city of the province and of course the Shaw Centre and our other partners in the city to, to help support that. And, uh, and that's, uh, I know the minister answered part of that question for sure, but did, uh, did appreciate the chance to, to put it out there. Yeah, I, I think one area that um, sort of we haven't really addressed is sport hosting. And I think that as we start to get back together, I'll, I'll address the, the convention piece in a second. But I, I do think that there is a, a real desire uh, for parents to uh, get their kids back into sport and recreation. And, uh, you know, we've been very good across Ontario and right here at home in encouraging people to uh, safely skate on the canal or take in um, our trails. But I think that there's a there's an opportunity there. Exploring Ottawa by the waterway is, is a great one. And then, um, and, and so that's a sort of the more leisure and, and sport tourism. And I know uh, I'm, I'm getting lots of letters from different parts of the province on, on different ideas that they have. Um, I also think that the convention piece um, one of the things that I've always thought would be a great idea is to put all of the big, um, the big um, uh, a convention and conference centers together and, and really look at what, uh, what we could do to best uh, bring our brand to the rest of uh, the world and make sure that uh, we, we're first in line for some of those international conferences. So we're going to continue to work and we've been meeting regularly with Destination Ontario. We've, uh, re we've retained many of our business to business relationships on the ground. And I know um, and Nina may want to address this as well. And I hate to call a friend here, but um, you know, we, we, we meet weekly as well to see how we can best uh, fill both um, MTCC and of course here at home, the Shaw. 
Um, so I don't know, Nina, if you, uh, I don't want to say anything, I maybe shouldn't, because I know that you, you are looking fairly optimistic about what the, uh, the future holds. Yes, thank you, Minister McLeod. And Oh, you're on mute, Nina. My apologies. Thank you, Minister McLeod. Um, I, I am optimistic. The, uh, the future short term looks very bright for us. The only concern that, that I would share, and, and Michael would probably share this with me as well, is you know, every city in the country will be vying for that next big piece of convention business. Um, so we definitely have to be out there. We have to be out there internationally and very creative with the offering of what Ottawa has and Canada has, because sometimes we compete obviously with other cities in our own province and country, but in some cases internationally with uh, other countries in the world. So uh, we do work hand in glove with Ottawa tourism and, uh, and the hotel community in a, in a, a fulsome uh, marketing strategy moving forward. But uh, I, I am very well aware of the competition that's out there and the incentives that uh, many of those cities are putting on the table to attract uh, significant major events. Thanks, Nina. That's great. Only other thing I might add to that, Suling, and I know yep. Michael's been part of some of these conversations and so have Nina. Um, we have so many cultural assets in the province and tourism assets that uh, we're working right now with um, the Ministry of Economic Development, to Job Creation and Trade, uh, in order to do some business to business um, supports in the United States and some of our key markets where we have trade offices. So uh, that work is being done with our ministerial advisory committees and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to wrap those up in the next couple of weeks and then get the work, uh, work done to support Michael and uh, the, other, the other 12 regional tourism organizations across the province. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, there's a question here saying in November, there were plans to improve the nightlife economy in Ottawa. Um, where are these plans now? Mayor Watson, do you have an update on the nightlife economy? <clears throat> yeah, so I'm just uh, trying to recharge my uh, my iPad. Um, yeah, there's a, a small group within um, the Economic Development Department, <clears throat> excuse me, of the city that are putting together a plan that will be brought forward for uh, committee and council approval in the next couple of months. It's to take some of the success of uh, nightlife in Montreal, in Austin, Texas, and so on, and bring it to Ottawa. You know, we have a bit of a reputation I've found it, but a bit of a reputation of rolling up the sidewalks after five. We need to beat that reputation with uh, programming and other activities and encourage people to stay downtown and to come downtown, both as residents and visitors. So uh, it's being worked on. Um, the media did a couple of stories on it. Uh, you know, you get, you know, the kind of, you know, oh, great Ottawa's, you know, trying to, you know, reinvent itself. Well, we're a great destination. We want to be even better in the nighttime. Uh, we, we're never going to be Paris, we're never going to be New York City, but I think we can up our game in terms of nighttime activities to help restaurants, bars, and, and the like uh, in, uh, in our urban core. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brent, I think this is to you. Just is there an update on access to PCR testing in Ottawa for the general public? It was funny, I was just writing a, a response to that. Um, so, so the first thing I would say is the eligibility criteria for PCR testing is, is set by the province. Um, and and they, they also, um, you know, fund the, the testing sites, um, which are operated by our, our hospital partners. And, and they've done a tremendous job uh, balancing all of the demands on, on, on their services. Um, you know, right now the the priority is is for symptomatic um, um, critical workers. Um, the province did add um, household members of um, of uh, highest risk uh, healthcare workers, um, and and so we'll see if, if you know with future revisions to the testing criteria if others are added. One of the observations I would make is that when the guidance was changed to five days isolation period, it kind of um, limits the usefulness of the PCR test because by the time you've had symptoms for a while, you make an appointment, you go for your PCR test, it goes to the lab, it comes back, 
you're, you're not going to gain a lot of time on, on, on that five-day period. Now, certainly people who work in highest risk settings, um, their isolation period is 10 days, and it certainly makes a big difference there. And particularly if looking at bringing back higher risk workers back into, say, a hospital setting or a long-term care setting, you, you really want to know whether they're, they're PCR positive or not, and, and then if you're going to be bringing them back if they've been a high-risk contact in an outbreak. But I think for most businesses, most settings, um, the combination of, of the five-day isolation period um, is such that it, it kind of makes the PCR testing um, not that, that useful or informative. Um, and when the rapid antigen testing, the rats become more available, that will be useful to, um, you know, for the person who has symptoms, for example, two negative tests 24 hours apart. Um, if they're negative and their symptoms are improving, then there's a green light that they probably don't have COVID and they can come back. So I think that's going to be more the useful piece to having workers come back quicker. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. I'll just quickly, sorry, did you want to say something, Mr. Fo Nope, good. Um, I just want to quickly answer Penny. Uh, we, we, if you're a small business and um, we hope within the next couple of weeks, but you can put your name on a waiting list through our website. Um, Dan uh, Gauthier is saying here, um, Dan, are you on the line still? Yeah. He's talking about um, the access to uh, the trade workers and wondering what the province can do to help small business in getting temporary foreign workers here faster. Yeah, thanks for that one. So that's uh, some indicative of the sectors I represent too. I bet you if you ask Colin and, or, um, or any of the restaurant owners here, even, even the festival and event folks, a lot of people are, are not, um, not doing, um, They've, they've left a lot of our industries um, it's very hard to get. So a couple of things that we're doing, um, at least in my portfolio, but they're doing it in the other ones that are also dealing with labor shortages. And, and Dr. Fullerton may want to speak as well about some of the things on the healthcare side. But, you know, we are working with the Ministry of Labor to do a number of different initiatives. Um, one is not just on temporary farm workers, although we have asked the federal government to increase our allocation and expedite that. So that work is ongoing. And I know um, last week I had the Minister of Labor on a call with me um, and he expressed that he had just spoken with the federal minister again that day about this issue. But there's a couple of other areas where we're actually encouraging people to get into the trades, whether that's in the construction trades or even on the more hospitality uh, tourism side of things. And, and it, it goes to a, a variety of different programs. I know Carolyn McChinnon's here and we were able to get to her some labor money um, in order to deal with, with, with upskilling. I know Andrea Steenbackers is here and we've had a conversation with the, the minister's uh, chief of staff in, in terms of supporting um, the business improvement areas here uh, through a training program. And, uh, then, and then obviously there are um, uh, tax credits that are available and we'll, we'll have a little bit more to say about that now that we're moving into reopening the economy um, for the last month the, the ministries uh, have been really focused on uh, health and education and I think you're going to start to hear a little bit more about some of the things that were in the last budget uh, around uh, uh, the reskilling and training uh, for those in the labor field and so I would be happy I'm just going to give you um, I'll give you my phone number in the chat box and you can uh, and connect with me today and I can put someone in touch with you directly uh, from the Ministry of Labor's uh, office. But uh, perhaps just because we have everybody on the line um, and I know she's very well versed at this, Minister Fullerton may want to talk a little bit more about the other side of things. So I'll talk about more of the economic side, but maybe on the healthcare side. Uh, she's, she's been doing all this for so long. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. McLeod. And certainly starting off as Minister of Training Colleges and Universities, I was very, very well aware of the importance of our academic institutions, our colleges and our universities in terms of creating the workforce we need today and, and tomorrow. And really understanding uh, once into long term care that we were short tens of thousands. And so it's, you know, it's just an amazing um, all hands on deck effort uh, across um, our educational systems and our apprenticeships really pulling everything together to, to fill the gaps that have been really, um, really very large for, for, you know, decades. So this is something that needs to be done. Uh, absolutely 27,000 um, positions for, for staff in, in, uh, in long term care, that's PSWs, that's nurses, uh, including RNs and RPNs, 
and, and understanding the significance of that. And if I can just also do a shout out to, you know, the really innovative people that we have in Ottawa, um, the uh, Ottawa paramedics, the Renfrew paramedics creating um, the community paramedic programs and that have been uh, really expanded across Ontario. These are key uh, for supporting our, our most vulnerable people. Um, as they age at home and being an aging population, this is in increasingly so. So it's uh, just, I wanna thank everyone who was involved in getting that program up and going and thanks to our municipal partners. And as well, you know, our, our local hospitals, the Queensway Carleton Hospital, uh, understanding how um, they can um, create more capacity in, in a local hotel um, that was empty at the beginning of all of this and they were able to use that innovative approach to create more capacity for our growing population. Um, and really these are unique, they're innovative. And, and uh, I just think it speaks to the, the, the all hands on deck effort. And I just really appreciate everyone who's, who's worked around the clock to get these programs going. Very good, thank you. So I see your question too, Carol Ann, from the Ottawa Festival Network, um, just a comment around how um, it can be so synergistic for businesses and festivals to be connected and supporting uh, greater festivals in our area. So uh, I think Minister McLeod, that probably is to you, is there something we can be doing uh, from the city or the province's perspective to uh, bring business and festivals together more? Collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. We're yeah. just doing this like in the ministry province wide. Um, it's why I've got these tables set and, and Michael is probably tired of me hearing, well, what's the stackable? What's the stackable? What's the incentive? Um, so we're going to have that $270 million uh, tax credit flow. Uh, we're going to uh, release about uh, just over $100 million uh, this week for many of our um, large attractions uh, and, uh, and tourism entities uh, this week. And it's really how do we build back and I hate to say it because it's everybody saying it build back better, but seriously like we have an opportunity here. Uh, and I, I have to the only way I'm like going to get through the days around here is if we actually plan instead of panic and so we've been trying to do that through the past two years with a level of optimism saying that the Ontario product is going to be better more authentic and refined post COVID-19. And so, you know, we're doing very well in Ottawa and I give Carol Ann and, and Michael and others so much credit because Ottawa, Ottawa is great. London's another spot, you know, Hamilton, I can't believe they're like, they're knocking it out of the park with all the sport hosting that they've done. Um, they've had the gray cup. They've had, um, they have the winter classic coming up and they had the, the, the big FIFA qualifier match yesterday. So it's, it's just bringing that all together and encouraging people to come see beyond. And, and again, I love Parliament Hill. I think it's an important thing that defines our, this city, but our city is where we live and it's where we play, it's where we work and we wanna showcase the whole thing. And the whole thing includes Blues Fest, it includes the Defum Bunker, it includes Stanley's Old Maple Farm, like it's all of that. And, and getting that out is, is really, really the key. Um, but I think there's a real opportunity in this um, because of the close linkages and relationships that we have in Ottawa uh, to really, really take that to the next level. And the other thing, Carol Ann, and, and Michael knows he's, I know he's just sent me that he's done all the incentives and the stackables because we're going, I, we want to build out itineraries around Ontario because right now we really aren't competing with other parts of this province. If we want people to come here, stay longer and spend more, we want them to take in multiple sites as you would if you go anywhere else like the United States or to Europe or uh, to Africa or, or um, uh, Middle East or, or, or Asia. And I think that that's one of the things that we're, we're really focusing on getting Destination Ontario to do um, in, on the marketing side, but also on the business side. And it's one of the things that we're starting to like, I'll give you one example on collaboration. So we've got a, a ministerial advisory committee on the, on the RTOs. Um, we have one on hospitality and we have another one on creative industries. And some of them have such common threads and we have one on travel actually. We have all the airlines and, and all the, uh, the uh, um, trains, uh, 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 train station, what are, like vias and, and the Northlander and, and the motor coaches and the buses. And so, when I, when I talk to the guys that are doing the motor coaches and buses, I actually encourage them to build out itineraries too, to work with the RTOs and then with the hotels and then the tourism attractions. So we have those folks as well. And so if everybody starts building that out and one of the, one of the ideas that we have and we're trying to figure out how we do it is actually have a better integrated way to travel across Ontario so that there's less, uh, 
less guesswork for people coming from here. And then the second piece on that is building out custom itineraries so that it's almost a, uh, itineraries for dummies. And I know we were told that they do a very good job of that down in Windsor Essex. So, so that would be great. And I didn't see Caroline, if you wanted to have a supplemental there. And yeah, okay. And then if you want to have a meeting with Destination Ontario, done. I think Jonathan Harris is here and I'll just make, make uh, him connect to, out to uh, Derek in my office and we'll get that set up. Very good. Well, thank you very much, everyone. We are at uh, time. And uh, I just want to thank, again, our, our guest speakers, Minister McLeod, Minister Fullerton, Mayor Watson, and Dr. Brent Maloney from Ottawa Public Health. Uh, this really has been a collaborative effort during very trying times. But what we know for sure that we've learned over the last couple of years is that the, he the health of our community, the economy of our community, and the mental well-being of our community is all intertwined. And that by working working together that we can accomplish a lot. So we can and continue to uh, work with all of our business and community leaders and our representatives um, and all of our businesses. Thank you for your continued resilience and support. And um, we will see you again very, very soon from the Board of Trade. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Celine. Thank you. Thank you.